another day, another recap, today we'll be diving into another movie franchise trilogy titled Narnia. This will include Narnia the Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, Narnia Prince Caspian and lastly Narnia the Voyage of the Dawn Treader. This action-fueled franchise will not disappoint you. And without further ado make sure to sit back, relax and as always enjoy the recap. The first movie opens up to an air raid across the city of London during the war. While bombs are being dropped all over the place, this forces the Pevensey family to hurry to their bomb shelter. One kid runs back into the house, and another chases after him. They grab a photograph of their father and run to the shelter. The oldest sibling expresses his frustration to the younger one for not listening but their mother puts an end to their disagreement. Soon after, the four Pevensey siblings join the rest of London's children to be evacuated to the countryside for the remainder of the war. Their mother gives them all a farewell starting with Peter. After that, their mother says goodbye to both Susan and the kid that ran back in the house, Edmund. Finally, the youngest of her children, Lucy, is given a hug. With that, they board the train and wave goodbye to their mother. The train goes from station to station and all across miles of country land until it stops at a tiny station named Coombe Halt. There they are picked up by a stern-looking Mrs. McCready on a horse-drawn carriage to head to the residence of Professor Kirk. Once inside, Mrs. McCready firmly tells the children to be well-behaved during their stay so as not to disturb the professor. That night, seeing the gloomy mood of their younger siblings, Peter and Susan try to convince them that they will enjoy their time in the countryside and will be back home soon. However, the next day dawns with heavy rainfall forcing everyone to stay indoors. Unable to deny his youngest sister her wish, Peter begins a game of hide-and-seek, while he counts, Susan, Edmund and Lucy split up around the mansion to find a place to hide. Lucy finds her way through an unlocked door and comes across an empty room with a large wardrobe. Happy about finding a great hiding place, she gets in and moves to its back, however she is surprised to find that the back opens into a snowy forest. Going further, she comes across a solitary lamppost and is soon alerted to the sound of approaching footsteps. Wary of having company in the strange place, she is startled to meet a fawn who not only speaks but even introduces himself as Mr. Tumnus. He informs her that they are in a land named Narnia, excited to know that she is a human. Mr. Tumnus convinces her to join him for some tea. Swayed by the promise of warmth and good food with a friend, Lucy accompanies him home. Over tea, he tells her about the curse on Narnia which has resulted in a harsh winter for over a century. Offering to play her a lullaby on his flute, Mr. Tumnus then puts her to sleep. When she wakes up a while later, she finds Mr. Tumnus overcome with guilt. He explains that the White Witch has cursed Narnia and that it is her orders that require any human wandering in the woods to be taken to her. A shocked Lucy is sad that the person she considered a friend intends to turn her in. Overwhelmed by her kindness, Mr. Tumnus then hurries her through the woods and ensures that she gets back home safely. However, she is shocked to know that despite having spent almost an entire day in Narnia almost no time had passed back home where everyone was still playing their game of hide and seek. On her insistence, Lucy's siblings check the back of the wardrobe for Narnia, but they find nothing. Unable to sleep that night she finds her way through the house when Edmund spots her and decides to follow her. With her heart set on Narnia she opens the wardrobe and gets in. Hoping to scare Lucy on her own, Edmund enters the wardrobe as well only to find that she was not lying about imagining Narnia. He walks around and is beyond bewildered. He calls out for Lucy and just keeps walking until a carriage passes him. Out of nowhere a dwarf jumps out and attacks him. The White Witch then stops her servant from harming Edmund. She learns that not only has Edmund's sister been to Narnia before and that she met a fawn but that there are four siblings in total. Her entire demeanor switches to kindness, conjuring up a warm drink and a dessert as per Edmund's wishes. The White Witch feeds Edmund a dream of being Narnia's ruler in return for getting all his siblings to meet her at her castle. Edmund is left on his own after the White Witch leaves and an ecstatic Lucy finds him. After she tells him that Mr. Tumnus is fine, Edmund says that he would like to go home. Hurriedly waking Peter up, Lucy excitedly tells him that Edmund saw Narnia as well, however she is saddened when Edmund lies and denies everything. Rushing out crying she knocks into the professor himself. He tells her everything will be okay and takes the eldest Pevensey siblings into his room. Susan tells him about Lucy imagining a magical land beyond the wardrobe and this spikes his interest. He sits them down and asks what the forest is like. Confused, Susan says why he would even entertain that idea for. The professor quite surprisingly tells them that she might not be making it all up. The next morning the kids go outside to play some cricket when Edmund accidentally breaks a window. This immediately earns the wrath of Mrs. McCready. Escaping from her, the siblings run and find themselves hiding in the wardrobe. And as you'd expect, they all eventually reach Narnia together. Finally forced to believe their youngest sister, Peter leaves it to Lucy to decide their next steps, she suggests that they all go meet her friend Mr. Tumnus. Agreeing with her plan, Peter borrows a few coats from the wardrobe and they set off through the woods. Upon reaching his house and finding it in disarray, they realize that he has been taken to the White Witch and charged with treason. Just as the siblings discuss whether they should go back home they are interrupted by the arrival of a talking beaver. 
When he addresses Lucy by name, she realizes that he knows Mr. Tumnus and they all follow him to his place. His wife, Mrs. Beaver, treats the children to a meal in the warmth of their home. Together, they then tell the Pavensi siblings about Aslan, the real king of Narnia. They also speak about a vision from the future that predicts the end of the cruel reign of the White Witch when the throne at Care Paravel is occupied by two sons and two daughters, implying that the four Pevensies will bring Narnia back to life with Aslan's help. Refusing to believe that they could have anything to do with this, Peter and Susan decide to leave. It is then that they notice Edmund's absence. Having sneaked off on his own, Edmund intends to reach the castle of the White Witch, which is also where the remaining Pevensey siblings head toward accompanied by Mr. Beaver. He stops them from storming in there by telling them that Edmund was just bait to get them all so that the vision doesn't come true. When he insists that only Aslan can help save Edmund, that is all it takes for Peter to go along with the plan. Meanwhile, Edmund enters a courtyard full of stone statues of various animals and beings, as he walks towards the throne room, a wolf stops him and asks him where he's headed. Edmund tells the beast he was invited and with that, he is escorted into the throne room. There is no one there at the time and so Edmund takes it upon himself to sit on the throne just as the White Witch enters. Starting off the conversation quite softly, she then suddenly begins shouting as she asked for Edmund's siblings as well. Startled by her sudden anger, Edmund lets slip that they are with the beavers. She calms down once again and imprisons her guest while telling her wolves to go get his siblings. Within minutes, the wolves surround the beavers' home with the kids inside. After Mrs. Beaver packs some food for their upcoming journey through the woods, the wolves manage to barge their way in. Finding the house empty, they realize that everyone has escaped through the tunnels below. Following Mr. Beaver's lead, everyone gets out of the tunnel and blocks the exit only to find that his friend and his family had all been turned to stone by the White Witch. With the help of another friend, Mr. Fox, they are able to point the wolves in the wrong direction. But it came at the cost of using himself as bait but fortunately enough to still be alive, the group take their leave. Mr. Fox then informs them that Aslan has asked him to gather all the troops possible. Insisting that they do not intend to fight a war in Narnia, Peter tells Mr. Fox and the beavers that they only need to get Edmund back. Meanwhile imprisoned in the dungeons, Edmund is forced to eat not the best of foods, but coincidentally he discovers that he is Sellies with Mr. Tumnus. As they get acquainted with one another, the White Witch barges in all angry and informs Edmund that her wolves were unable to find his siblings, as he was now useless to her. She threatens to end his life until he mentions the beavers speaking about Aslan, however when she realizes that he doesn't know anything more about Aslan's location or plan, she orders Mr. Tumnus to be released from the dungeon and brought upstairs, but before that she tells him that it was Edmund who snitched him in and had him caught. Elsewhere through the woods Peter, Susan and Lucy accompany Mr. and Mrs. Beaver as they lead them to Aslan. Meanwhile, Edmund sees Mr. Tumnus turned to stone in the courtyard before the White Witch orders him to join her on her sleigh to find his family. While his family and the beavers slowly make their way across the frozen land they suddenly spot someone on a sleigh following them. Thinking it to be the White Witch, they hurriedly hide, but it surprisingly turns out to be just an old man. As it turns out with their arrival in Narnia, the Pevensies brought a good old friend with them. Giving out some presents he brought, he gifts Lucy the juice of a fire flower with healing properties and a small dagger. Susan gets a bow with a quiver of arrows and a magical horn to call for help, and Peter receives a sword and a shield. Acknowledging Aslan and wishing them well, he then gets on his way. However, Peter realizes that the end of winter implies that they will not find ice on their path across the river as they had hoped to anymore. But with the wolves and the White Witch on their trail, they do not seem to have much time to think about other options. Cautiously making their way across the fast-melting river, the group is suddenly surrounded by wolves on both sides. When Lucy spots the waterfall about to give way and explode with shards of ice, Peter slams his sword into a slab of ice on the river as the wall completely breaks. This allows his family to hold onto Peter and his sword down the current of the river. This inevitably gets everyone to safety while successfully evading the wolves as well. Abandoning their heavy winter coats further in the woods, the Pevensies and the Beavers head to Aslan's camp. Meanwhile the White Witch is presented with a captured Mr. Fox who respectfully addresses Edmund. In an attempt to save his life, Edmund informs the White Witch of Aslan forming an army at the stone table however. She turns Mr. Fox to stone anyway and then orders the wolves to gather an army of their own. Arriving at Aslan's massive camp the Pevensies are immediately recognized as royalty. Everyone there walks with their guests through the camp until they reach a tent. Peter addresses himself and wants to speak to the king. With that, Aslan, a massive lion, walks out of the tent and greets his visitors. He realizes that one of the humans are missing though, and once Peter explains he was captured by the White Witch, Mr. Beaver alerts Aslan to Edmund's betrayal. Aureus is immediately enraged but is told to calm down. The king then speaks privately with Peter, assuring him that he will do everything he can to help Edmund. When Peter seems unsure about his role in Narnia, he is told that his destiny is to be the High King and to occupy the throne at Care Paravel. Hearing Susan's horn being blown at that moment, he immediately rushes to help and realizes that the wolves have reached the camp. With Aslan trapping one wolf Peter is left to deal with the other. 
Suddenly, put through a test of wits, Peter successfully ends the wolf with his sword. Aslan then releases the wolf he held back and sends a few centaur and fawn troops to follow him to find Edmund. Impressed with Peter's will to fight for the safety of his family, Aslan then awards him the knighthood of Narnia. Later that evening, the White Witch's army prepare for battle and make a plan of attack. The wolf from earlier runs into the base with Aslan's troops following it and finding Edmund. When the White Witch sees what's happened, she discovers her prisoner has been freed. The following morning, Peter wakes up to see Aslan speaking with Edmund. His other two siblings also see this interaction until finally, Edmund joins his family and apologizes for what he has done. They all forgive him, and the family is finally back together again. Over a meal later, Peter discusses staying back to help Narnia on his own when Edmund insists that they all need to join Aslan together to defeat the White Witch. Following this decision, the girls head off to practice their shooting while the boys begin their sword fighting training. Surprisingly, they are interrupted soon after by news of the White Witch's arrival. When the boys go to the camp, they see her being carried in by her troops. She approaches the king and lays claim to the traitorous Edmund as per the Narnian laws which is, every traitor belongs to her. Even after Peter draws his sword, the White Witch claims that all of Narnia will be perished in fire and water until she kills Edmund on the stone table as per their traditions. Aslan then asks to speak with the witch privately. After their discussion, Aslan announces that he won back Edmund and everyone rejoices. However, Lucy spots Aslan looking sad because of whatever he had to promise the White Witch in return. Later that night, Lucy and Susan spot Aslan sneaking through the camp and they decide to follow him. However, he notices this and allows them to accompany him through the forest. He says to them that they need to trust him and bids them farewell. Continuing alone, the girls secretly follow him, and from a safe distance away, they witness Aslan approach the White Witch at the stone table. Walking through the savage army, they laugh and taunt him. Intending to shame him, the White Witch has him smacked to the ground. While the girls watch, Aslan is bound and shaved in disgrace. The White Witch then informs him that offering his life in return for Edmunds is meaningless since she intends to attack Narnia the next morning. Amidst celebration and thorough fanfare of her loyal troops, the White Witch then slays Aslan before announcing going into battle with Narnia. After everyone clears out a while later, grief-stricken Susan and Lucy approach Aslan. They get rid of the ties binding him and then send a message of Aslan's death and the approaching army of the White Witch to Peter and Edmund through the trees. Left with no other option but to lead the Narnian troops into battle, Peter steps into his destined role to face the evil approaching. On the battlefield, thousands of soldiers ready to give their lives for Narnia. A scout tells Peter they are thoroughly outnumbered by the army of the White Witch, but numbers do not always win battles and with this in mind the enemy troops approach, using their numbers to cause fear in those who want to fight for a better day. Both armies taunt one another, and with that the battle begins. As the White Witch's army charges forward, Peter's army launches an air assault and chuck rocks and boulders on the troops. They are shot out of the sky and now begins the ground assault led by Peter himself. With an arrow-like formation, the two armies collide and the death toll begins. Meanwhile, back at the stone table, Susan and Lucy leave Aslan's side, however they are shocked when the stone table cracks behind them. Aslan is nowhere to be seen when he suddenly appears out of nowhere. The girls hug him, and he explains to them that when a willing victim has committed no treachery and is killed in a traitor's stead, the table will crack and the death will be reversed. He tells the girls they have a new mission, and back on the battlefield, Peter and the White Witch see one another as a phoenix sets flames to the middle of the battle, the witch removes it though, and Peter tells his army to fall back. Once his army enter an enclosed area, the archers join the battle, but Peter is simultaneously shot off his horse. Aureus sees this and decides to charge headfirst against the entire enemy army and kill whoever he can. He goes directly for the White Witch and attempts to stab her but she beats him to it. Lucy and the others in the meantime go to resurrect their friends turned into stone. Mr. Tumnus is one of the first to be brought back to life. Aslan then unites who he can and heads to help Peter win the battle. On the battlefield, the White Witch gets her hands dirty and joins the fight. Realizing their disadvantageous position, Peter urges Edmund to head home with the girls. Edmund then sees the White Witch turn everything around her to stone and approaching his brother. Edmund defies Peter's orders and goes to take on the White Witch. Doing what he can, he shatters one of the witch's swords but is then stabbed. As he drops, Peter sees this and decides to take on the witch. But even with his rage, he stands no chance. Fighting to the best of his ability to the end, Aslan's roar stops the witch in her tracks. With the hundreds of extra fighters they join the midst of the battle as Peter is dropped and pinned down. With seconds left of his life, Aslan jumps in and saves him. The White Witch is then finally killed and with her death, Aslan declares the end of the battle. When her dwarf servant makes to attack an injured Edmund, Susan shoots an arrow to take him down. Lucy then uses her healing potion to cure him, and Peter lovingly chides him for disobeying him. While Aslan resurrects his troops that were turned to stone, Lucy goes around the battlefield with her healing potion to help the injured. After a victorious battle, Ker Paravel is restored to its former glory as it gains its four kings and queens exactly. The Pavensi siblings gracefully accept their crowns. After the coronation, Aslan takes his leave which deeply saddens Lucy. Mr. Tumnus comforts her by assuring her that he will be back when Narnia needs his help. 
Fifteen years go by as Narnia flourishes under its rulers, and one fine day the grown-up Pevensies pursue a white stag through the woods. When they come across a solitary lamppost, Lucy recognizes it and leads the others to the wardrobe that started it all. Passing through the coats, they surprisingly return to Professor Kirk's mansion as the kids they were when they left, implying that almost no time passed during their Narnian stay. When Lucy visits the wardrobe once again that night, she is startled to find Professor Kirk there. He informs her that he has already tried going back to Narnia and has been unsuccessful. However, he also assures her that they will be able to return when they least expect to. The second movie opens up 1300 years after the end of the Pevensey's Narnian reign. Pruniprismia gives birth to the Prince of Telmar. After General Glozel informs the brothers King and the new father Miraz of the news, the general is then instructed to carry out his orders. Meanwhile, Dr. Cornelius wakes his mentee, Prince Caspian the rightful heir to the throne and informs him of the danger he faces now that Miraz has a son of his own, quickly hiding just in time, Caspian then witnesses the general and his men shoot at his recently vacated bed. Led by Dr. Cornelius, he hurriedly arms himself and is instructed to head to the woods where the troops will not follow him. He is then given Queen Susan's magical horn with strict instructions to use only when absolutely required. This is the only farewell he gets before having to flee the castle. As correctly predicted by Dr. Cornelius, the troops falter the moment Caspian enters the woods, determined to carry out Miraz's order, the general enters the woods and gets his men to follow him as well. Being chased for quite a distance the men go across the river and sprint through the thick woods, but problematically Caspian falls off his horse, as the horse rides away Caspian is startled to see two dwarves. Spotting Queen Susan's horn they realize that Caspian might not be trouble, and one of them heads off to distract the approaching soldiers while Caspian blows the ancient magical horn for help. In London, it has been a year since the Pevensies returned from their glorious time in Narnia back to their normal lives. Peter, Susan, Edmund and Lucy are waiting at the station to board a train to head to school. Suddenly, strong winds enter the train station and begin tearing it apart, everything begins to break, and just like that the Pevensies are transported back to Narnia. Relieved at being back they play along the beach for a while before noticing ruins atop the mountain. Walking around the overgrowth they wonder who lived there when Susan stumbles upon a chess piece that Edmund recognizes. Finally realizing where they were, Lucy gets the others to picture their thrones and they understand that they were indeed at Care Paravel. Meanwhile, General Glozel and his men return from the woods with a mysterious bundle. During the council's session, Miraz is questioned regarding Caspian's sudden disappearance. Tackling Sopespian's direct taunt, Miraz announces that Caspian was abducted by the Narnians. To support his claim he gets General Glozel to reveal the dwarf they captured in the woods, since Narnians were widely believed to have disappeared since the invasion of the Telmarines, seeing such concrete evidence shocks everyone. At Ker Paravel, the siblings break into their castle and reach the storage space to borrow some of their things when Susan realizes that her horn is missing, nearby a couple of soldiers are assigned to drown the Narnian dwarf. As fate would have it the Pevensies get there just in time to save him. While Edmund secures the boat, Peter rescues the bound dwarf. The siblings are surprised to hear that there are Telmarine soldiers in Narnia now when the dwarf recognizes Peter's sword. While he realizes that he is in the company of royalty, he isn't impressed by the fact that they are children. To prove their worth, Peter lends the dwarf his sword and urges him to fight with Edmund. Quickly overpowered by Edmund's expertise he realizes that the horn possibly got Narnia the best help it could get. Elsewhere, Caspian wakes up to an argument between Nicabric the dwarf and Trufflehunter, the badger. When he tries to escape Nicabric immediately moves in for an attack. But Truffle-Hunter diffuses the situation. Having difficulty grasping the fact that Narnians exist, Caspian confesses that his life is in danger because his uncle has been after his throne. Back at the castle, Dr. Cornelius finds Miraz waiting for him to ask about the horn. Dr. Cornelius replies that the Narnians believed that it had the magical ability to bring back their beloved kings and queens. Assuming that Caspian was told about these old tales, Miraz imprisons Dr. Cornelius just in time for Sopespian to see him being taken away. Miraz then instructs General Glozel to head to Baruna to help with the construction of the bridge across the river, so as to nab Caspian as soon as possible. Setting sail with the dwarf, the Pevensies are informed that the Telmarines attacked soon after Narnia lost its rulers causing the survivors to hide in the woods and the trees. Peter then asks him to direct them to the remaining Narnians. Going ashore soon after, Lucy encounters a bear which she assumes to be a friendly Narnian, however it turns out to be a wild one that the dwarf takes down to save Lucy's life. Meanwhile Caspian makes his way through the woods with Nicabric and Trufflehunter. When he asks them about Aslan they wonder how he knows so much about the Narnians, he simply says that his professor told him multiple tales of the old times. Just then, the arrival of several soldiers interrupts their conversation and gets them to run and dodge their attack. When Trufflehunter gets hit, Caspian stops to help when he notices the soldiers being attacked by an unseen force. Quickly picking him up Caspian continues running even as the soldiers continue to be struck. 
handing Truffle Hunter over to Nicabric, Caspian then sees that only a solitary soldier remained. Once he is also taken down, the unseen force is revealed to be a talking mouse when he makes his way to Caspian and challenges him to a duel. Truffle Hunter addresses the mouse Reepicheep, and informs him that it was Caspian who blew the horn and called for help. With this, several centaurs reveal themselves and announce that they would like to meet Caspian. Meanwhile, Peter leads the group through the woods to where the dwarf had seen Caspian. Having been named DLF for Dear Little Friend, the dwarf tries to tell Peter that Narnia has changed and that the roots he knew from back then do not exist anymore. Suddenly, Lucy claims to see Aslan across the canyon. However, since nobody else could see him, they dismiss her and head to Baruna as per the DLF's plan. In the woods Caspian is surrounded by several Narnians as he tries to convince them to join him in his battle for the throne. He promises the establishment of peace between their kind so the Narnians won't have to live in hiding anymore. Convinced that only a son of Adam can bring peace to Narnia, the centaurs take the initiative to join Caspian followed by the others. Guided by the DLF the Pevensies arrive at Baruna and witness the construction of a bridge. Realizing that they could not go ahead this way, they head back to where Lucy spotted Aslan instead. Carefully descending the canyon the group then gradually make their way following Lucy's lead. Successfully crossing the gorge by nightfall Lucy is suddenly woken up early the next morning. Following her intuition through the woods she is delighted to find the trees the way she expected them to be in Narnia. Further ahead through the path created for her she comes across Aslan himself, however just as she asks him why he hadn't helped Narnia, a cracking sound wakes her up to reveal that this was a dream. To her disappointment though when she goes around the woods for real this time the trees remain still and there is no Aslan either. Instead Peter stops her just in time before checking for a potential threat. Suddenly Caspian gets there and engages in an intense sword fight with him. Lucy stops them when she sees several centaurs, fawns and dwarves gather and realizes that they are among friends. Peter and Caspian realize who the other is, and Reepicheep is an instant hit with the Pevensies when he informs them that he has been working hard to gather weapons for the upcoming battle. At Baruna meanwhile, Glozel informs Miraz and Sopespian that two regiments worth of weapons had been looted by the Narnians who had left behind only a daunting message from Caspian. On the other hand the Pevensies accompanied by Caspian and the Narnians arrive at Aslan's How. Looking around the underground space the siblings come across their own stories etched into the stone and Caspian leads them further in, revealing the cracked stone table amidst all the rich history of the Pevensies and Aslan. Outside one of the lookouts sees a Telmarine soldier watching and then running off. Considering how Aslan had not yet appeared despite Narnia needing his help, Peter determines that it is up to them to save the land, however he clashes over a difference of opinion with Caspian. While Caspian wants to strengthen their hold at Aslan's how, Peter wants to surprise the Telmarines by attacking their castle first. That night Peter decides to lead some troops for a surprise attack. He starts the assault by sending Edmund with a griffin to take out one of the sentry guards. After receiving the all-good signal more griffins approach carrying Peter, Caspian and Susan. The small Narnian army then silently move forth towards the castle. Reepicheep and his comrades then break in as Caspian and the others silently fly around the base and kill all peripheral guards. Following this they decide to descend into the castle via a window and set out to look for Dr. Cornelius. It is then that Reepicheep and his men take out not just one but two guards before unlocking the door for DLF to kill a third. Just then Caspian both finds and frees Dr. Cornelius but is shocked to know that his father died under suspicious circumstances. He immediately runs off and heads over to his uncle Miraz in a rage. Miraz taunts him while Pruniprismia aims a crossbow at him. Susan and Peter barge in to help Caspian who insists on knowing the truth from his uncle. When Miraz confirms Caspian's doubt even Pruniprismia is shocked to know that her husband got rid of his own brother because of his greed for the throne. For the love of her son though, she shoots her intruder which lets Miraz escape. Because of Caspian's detour the Narnian troops are still waiting for Edmund's signal even as the alarm is raised through the castle. Despite Susan stating that they may have lost their chance, a stubborn Peter insists on opening the gate and gets into a few battles along the way. Edmund is also fighting his own battle but easily wins. DLF and Reepicheep begin lowering the castle's drawbridge. Edmund gives the Narnians the go-ahead and with that, they charge for the castle and the combat begins. And as you'd expect, they go really hard, they continue their assault, and finally find Miraz watching the battle. Peter and Caspian along some other troops attempt to finally kill him, but problematically fail. During this process the DLF is also gravely injured. As a combined consequence of not only underestimating the Telmarines but Caspian's swaying from the plan and Peter's misplaced determination, the Narnians find themselves outnumbered. Peter orders the troops to retreat past a rapidly closing gate. Rescuing Dr. Cornelius, Caspian and Peter get away, but only about half of the Narnians are able to escape the wrath of Miraz. Back at Aslan's How, Lucy meets the dejected and clearly reduced troops of Narnia. Things seem to have worsened between Peter and Caspian as they each blame the other for the attack gone wrong. Drawing swords at one another, they stop when they realize DLF is being put to rest. Lucy runs and gives him a drink from her healing potion which brings him back to life. 
On the other hand, Miraz gains enough favor from his leaders to place himself on the throne and be crowned as the king. He immediately orders troops across Baruna's completed bridge towards the Narnians. In a strange turn of events, Nicabric suggests that Caspian uses another ancient power to gain his throne. Not believing in Peter and his siblings, he offers Caspian a power that Aslan took 100 years to stop. The dark magic then brings forth two wicked creatures who draw a circle in the ground beneath Caspian. But one of the creatures stabs the White Witch's sword on the ground which causes the spirit of the White Witch to be summoned. Caspian is informed that a drop of his blood will be enough to resurrect her. As she reaches to touch the blood, Peter and Edmund get there with Lucy just in time to stop Caspian. While the DLF has to stab his own friend Nicabric for attacking Lucy, the White Witch attempts to sway Peter in her favor. However, Edmund shatters the ice to put an end to the possibility of her return. Later, Dr. Cornelius assures Caspian of the opportunity he has to be the exception to the rule. To be the Telmarine that saves Narnia. Meanwhile, Peter discusses why Aslan hasn't appeared with Lucy when Edmund runs in to alert them about the arrival of the massive Telmarine army. Realizing that Aslan is indeed the only way to save Narnia yet again, Peter decides to send Lucy and Susan into the woods to find him. To delay the Telmarine attack, Caspian suggests that Peter challenge Miraz to a single combat. When Edmund goes over to the Telmarine camp to deliver the message, he witnesses how pride comes in the way of Miraz refusing the duel. But due to his fear of being mocked by the other nobles, Miraz eventually accepts the challenge. As Susan and Lucy take off towards the woods, Peter enters the battlefield to face Miraz. Both armies chant and taunt each other as Miraz tells his general that if things are going poorly, you know what to do. Both the kings sheathe their swords and approach one another. The duel begins amidst heavy cheers from both camps even as Peter takes a few initial blows. In the woods some Telmarine troops follow Susan and Lucy. Compelled to fight them, Susan lets Lucy go ahead on her own. Once their enemies are in sight, Lucy fires away, killing one soldier at a time. Problematically, one of the soldiers smacks her to the ground but Caspian comes to her rescue and even offers her a ride. The intense duel continues at Aslan's Howe with Peter and Miraz coming across as quite well matched in their skills. Both injure each other, and Miraz manages to get Peter onto the ground and pin him. He rolls away and manages to get Miraz on the ground. When Peter spots Susan with Caspian, both kings agree to a momentary respite from the duel. Relieved to know that Lucy went ahead he then thanks Caspian for saving Susan. Susan then hugs her brother and takes her place with the archers. Both the kings get patched up and with that, the duel begins again. Miraz comes out fast and puts up a strong attack despite his injury. Peter refuses to just let the tyrant win and fights back just as hard. Peter then manages to overpower him though. And with another attack on Miraz's injured leg Miraz requests a respite again but attacks Peter nonetheless. This time he gets stabbed with his own sword in return and Peter then offers it to Caspian for the final move. Unwilling to be a ruthless ruler like his uncle Caspian spares his life and states that he intends to return Narnia to its people. However this does not cement their victory since Sopespian stabs Miraz with a Narnian arrow and accuses them of treachery. Instantly, Peter kills a Telmarine and the army in return shoots catapults at the Narnians, they miss though, and the general gives the attack order. The first wave of Telmarines approach but the Narnians hold their ground. Following Peter's signal Caspian rushes back underground to lead their troops to battle. They all charge to the fight as their enemies approach with their swords drawn. Peter counts aloud, and when he finally reaches ten, Caspian and the troops below destroy the pillars underground. This gives way as the Telmarine soldiers fall and stop in their tracks. The Narnian archers then fire their arrows at the stagnant army and kills many of them. Peter tells his troops to charge, and everyone runs as Caspian emerges from underground to flank the enemies from the rear. A combined effort from both fronts allows the Narnians the advantage to slaughter and kill their enemies from all sides, however, the second wave is much bigger and so the Griffins holding some Narnians approach but are shot out of the sky. Peter looks around and knows they will not win this way, and orders an immediate retreat. Problematically though, the catapults fire at will and block the entrance to the Howe. Surrounded by Telmarine soldiers, Peter and Caspian have no other option left but to put up a good fight, and are joined in this deed by Edmund, Susan and the rest of the Narnians. Elsewhere in the woods Lucy is followed by a Telmarine soldier when she sees a lion. It quickly attacks the approaching soldier, and she recognizes the lion as Aslan. She is relieved at having finally found him and confesses that she was too scared to look for him on her own before. She then tries convincing him to help, and after he mumbles some wise words he agrees to it and roars as loud as he can. Back on the field it seems to be a completely hopeless battle for the Narnians faced with the huge Telmarine army. With every Narnian trying their best to overcome this massacre, they slowly get boxed in by their enemies. Some Narnians attempt to break the line but Caspian problematically ends up at Glozel's mercy, however, the roots of a tree suddenly come to life and attack him. The trees around the battlefield all awaken and fight against the Telmarines, and Peter realizes that Lucy was successful in her mission. With nature fighting against them, the Telmarine army loses all their catapults, 
the Narnians get a much needed boost and their enemies decide to head towards the river in the hopes of defeating the Narnians. But once there, the army spots Lucy on one side of the bridge while the other is covered by the Narnians. Aslan then appears, and so Pespian leads the troops through without thought but is in for a surprise when Aslan roars. The river then begins acting quite odd and suddenly comes to life. It starts taking out all nearby enemies and immediately uproots and destroys the bridge bringing Sopespian to face level. He is immediately chucked alongside the now destroyed bridge. The Narnian's victory is finally secured, and the Telmarine soldiers surrender their weapons as Peter, Susan and Edmund meet Auslan with Caspian. Caspian is named a king alongside the others. Lucy then fixes Reepicheep with her healing potion who is shocked to find himself in Aslan's company and discovers his tail to be missing. Impressed with his manners and the loyalty of his comrades, Aslan grants him a new tail. He then lets out a loud roar to ensure that Lucy's DLF knows that he is indeed real. After the entire ordeal, Caspian has his coronation to make him one of royalty. He immediately causes every single person whether they are a Narnian or a Telmarine to attend a meeting. As a kind king, Caspian offers peaceful Telmarines the opportunity to continue living in Narnia. The others are offered to begin a new life in the world of the Pevensies, and Aslan also agrees. Glozel is the first to volunteer for a new beginning accompanied by Pruniprismia and her son. Aslan then causes a tree to open a portal into the world. Readying to leave, Peter says he is no longer needed and hands his king's sword over to Caspian who says he will look after it. Susan then tells him that both she and Peter will not be returning as they have learnt all they can from Narnia. As per Aslan, they add that Edmund and Lucy would return when Narnia needs them in the future. After a fond farewell, the Pevensey siblings walk through the portal and return to London. They all board the train headed for school like they were supposed to, only for Edmund to realize that he left his torch in Narnia. The third movie opens up to Edmund attempting to enlist in a war with a fake identity, but is laughed out of the office for not being of age yet. Lucy and Edmund have been staying in Cambridge while their parents moved to America with Peter and Susan. While their aunt and uncle are somewhat tolerable, their cousin Eustace is a menace, he doesn't appreciate having guests in his house for so long and keeps finding a way to make life difficult for them. One such morning, Edmund and Lucy are wistfully observing a painting of a ship that reminds them of Narnia when Eustace barges in and mocks them for believing in magic and fairy tales, ignoring him. Lucy notices the painting's water moving. While Edmund bickers with Eustace, the water overflows into Lucy's room. Despite Eustace attempting to destroy the painting, the room continues to flood. When they resurface, they find themselves in the path of a majestic ship at sea, Surprisingly, they are rescued by Caspian and taken on board. When asked whether he called for their help, Caspian replies that he hadn't. Just then, a commotion grabs their attention when Eustace discovers Reepicheep trying to resuscitate him. He is further alarmed when Reepicheep begins talking and a talking minotaur is his last straw which causes him to faint. Caspian then introduces Edmund and Lucy to the crew of his ship, the Dawn Treader. He then shows the Pevensies around as they see how lovingly the ship has been designed to honor not just Aslan, but Narnia's beloved rulers as well. Having promised to save everyone's precious items, Caspian hands over Lucy's healing potion and dagger and Edmund's torch as well. He then informs them that it has been three years since he ascended the throne and that he has established peace across Narnia since then, which causes Edmund to wonder why they were summoned this time. When asked about the destination of their voyage, Caspian answers that he hopes to reach the Lone Islands to find the seven nobles of Telmar who were banished by Miraz in his pursuit of the throne. Lucy learns from Reepicheep later that the Lone Islands are so far east towards the end of the world that only Aslan's country possibly lies beyond them. While she is happy about being back in Narnia with Edmund who even engages in a friendly sword fight with Caspian on the deck, the same cannot be said about their cousin. Eustace continues to be as grumpy as ever and complains about being kidnapped and the lack of hygiene on board when the Lone Islands come into view. Caspian instructs his captain Drinian to gather some men for a landing party along with Tavros the Minotaur. Eustace continues to grumble as he joins the landing party ashore, even as Lucy observes that the island seemed deserted. Leaving him as a lookout, Caspian joins Edmund and Lucy further in to explore, and they realize that slaves were traded there. Just then, several people descend around them and an intense fight breaks out, but it quickly stops as Eustace is held at knife point. Caspian and Edmund are imprisoned while Lucy and Eustace are considered to be sold as slaves. In the dungeon, Caspian meets Byrne, one of the seven nobles that he set out to find. Straining to look through the window, Edmund sees a bunch of unsold slaves being forcibly taken away. While Caspian joins him at the window, Byrne urges them to witness the unsold slaves being sacrificed to a strange green mist across the ocean. He then informs Caspian that nobody knew what was happening to these people, and also that multiple nobles had attempted to seek its source, but they all ended up disappearing. Realizing its danger, Edmund fears for Lucy even as she is presented for an auction, quite popular among the potential buyers, Lucy gets easily sold. Caspian and Edmund are forced out of the dungeon just as Eustace's auction begins. Drinian, Reepicheep and a few other crew members disrupt the auction, seeing which Caspian and Edmund fight their respective captors as well. 
Amidst all the chaos, Reepicheep frees Lucy and, inspired by the revolt, residents of the island gradually emerge to help. One of them, Rents, requests to join Caspian later to look for his wife who was sacrificed to the mist. Safely hidden in a cave all these years, a sword is presented to Caspian by Byrne who says that it was one of seven such swords that Aslan had given the nobles for protecting Narnia. Caspian entrusts the priceless sword to Edmund, and they set off to uncover the mystery of the disappeared people. On board the Dawn Treader the following day, Reepicheep catches Eustace stealing food and challenges him to a duel. Once he grabs the stolen orange back the entire crew gathers to witness the entertainment. To showcase his skill through the duel, Reepicheep even trains Eustace and fools him once as well. The end of the fight brings to light the fact that Reince's daughter Gail had sneaked on board to join her father. A few days later, the Dawn Treader is within reach of another deserted island, and Caspian decides to spend a night there before exploring around the next day. That night however, Lucy gets abducted by strange voices that only leave behind giant footprints. A little distance away she is dropped and then threatened by the invisible beings to enter the house of the oppressor if she wants her friends to keep their lives. A magical door appears in the forest and Lucy is given instructions to find a spell book and to then recite the one to cure invisibility. When she is told that these beings can neither read nor write she decides to help them and enters the door. Early the next morning the crew wakes up to find Lucy missing and when they notice the giant footprints everyone hurriedly follows them into the forest. However a soundly sleeping Eustace gets left behind. Meanwhile Lucy spots the spell book in the mansion and opens it. Inside she finds a spell that claims to make her beautiful. The adjoining page becomes a mirror and Lucy sees Susan there instead of herself. She excitedly reads the spell while tearing the page off and hiding it in her clothes. Finally finding the visibility spell, she begins reading it aloud. Meanwhile Caspian and the crew are attacked by the invisible beings just as Lucy finishes reading the spell which reveals the beings to just be duffelpuds, dwarves with one large leg. Eustace manages to find everyone and complains as he spots the creatures. The Duffelpuds confess that they sent Lucy into the mansion which also suddenly comes into full view. Lucy then returns with the man the Duffelpuds call the oppressor and rush to get away from him. She then introduces the man as the island's owner, Cory Aiken. He brings everyone inside his mansion, and he opens up a map of Narnia there to inform them that the mist originates from the Dark Island which has the power of making anyone's darkest dreams come true. To break the mist spell, they need to follow the Blue Star to Ramondu's Island where the Seven Swords have to be laid at Aslan's table to unleash their power. Mentioning that the evil mist will not be easy to reject, he advises them to remain strong till the last sword is laid. All aboard again with a new mission in place, the Dawn Treader faces the roughest weather for two weeks. Drinian reports to Caspian one day that they have rations for another two weeks at the most and suggests turning back since they haven't yet spotted the Blue Star. However, he gets back to work when reminded about finding Reince's wife. Meanwhile, Lucy recites the beauty spell and turns into Susan. In a dreamlike state where neither Lucy exists nor does Narnia, she gets scared and asks for it to stop. Aslan appears and reminds her that without her the Pevensies would not have known of Narnia to begin with. He urges her to value herself and a loud crack of lightning wakes Lucy up from her dream. Immediately crumpling the stolen page she throws it in the fire. However the trouble doesn't seem to end here as the green mist makes its way through the Dawn Treader and while Caspian is troubled with dreams about his father, Edmund is being lured by the White Witch. The following morning the crew go to explore the island. As they row their boats ashore, Eustace slips away from the group on his own meanwhile. Edmund descends through a narrow canyon into a cave, while Caspian and Lucy follow him down. He looks around the wide underground space and comes across a gold statue in the water. Caspian recognizes the crest on the shield nearby as belonging to another king and his sword is spotted as well. It is soon discovered that the water turned everything it touched into pure gold, and they realize that the statue was indeed the missing noble himself. However, tempted by the power of the magical water, Edmund picks a fight with Caspian and states that he deserves to have a kingdom of his own. Witnessing the beginnings of a duel between the two of them, Lucy reminds them of Coriacan's warning and the temptations of the evil. Elsewhere on the island, Eustace discovers various treasures in a pit, and hurriedly gathers a few items before coming across a skeleton. Shoving it away he then continues to steal some of the vast treasure. While preparing to leave the island, Lucy realizes that Eustace is missing and Edmund and Caspian go looking for him. Among the pit of treasure, they come across Eustace's abandoned clothes. Looking around, Caspian recognizes the remains of another of the nobles as Edmund finds his sword among the treasure. Meanwhile the rest of the crew aboard the Dawn Treader hear a massive sound. They spot flames in the distance, and Drinian tells his crew that a dragon is approaching, and he is spot on. As the dragon flies around it stops on the boat and is immediately fired at. Before he can break the mast, Reepicheep attacks the dragon and causes it to fly back to the island. Weirdly enough it grabs Edmund and flies him over to read a message saying he was Eustace. As it turns out the treasure that tempted Eustace was enchanted and caused him to turn into a dragon. Unsure of how to turn him back or to reverse the curse, the group splits up with some headed back to the boat and some sleeping on the island for the night. That night while everyone sleeps by the fire built by Eustace, 
Reepicheep heads over to a sad dragon and attempts to befriend him by keeping him company through the night. Gale wakes Lucy early the next morning having discovered the Blue Star. The Dawn Treader immediately sets its course while Eustace flies along beside them, however, Lucy spots a mermaid desperately asking her not to go ahead, but they forge ahead with their journey proven to be quite difficult with no land in sight for days. Eventually, Eustace decides to help and pulls the Dawn Treader along all the way to Ramandu's island, perched on his head Reepicheep cheers for his friend's extraordinary effort. Once on the island the group eventually arrives at Aslan's table. There they discover three nobles under a spell, quickly gathering their swords and adding the three that were found along the way, the six swords are placed on the table which leaves only one more. Just then, the blue star descends and transforms into a woman and introduces herself as Ramandu's daughter, Liliandal. When asked about the sleeping kings she says that they broke the rules of Aslan's table by threatening violence and hence were put to sleep. Inviting the crew to feast at the table, Liliandal then guides Caspian, Edmund and Lucy towards the Dark Island. Pointing to the island she says that it is where they will find the seventh sword but warns them to be courageous enough to face the evil that resides there. The next morning the Dawn Treader arrives at the Dark Island as everyone prepares to fight their worst nightmares as well as their darkest wishes. Gale in the meantime tells Lucy she wants to grow up to be like her. This is a massive compliment to Lucy and while they speak Caspian tells Edmund he thinks of him like a brother. He then hands over Peter's sword to Edmund and he gladly accepts it. Reepicheep motivates Eustace to fearlessly face through their fears and find their destinies. Speaking to his crew, Caspian then inspires them to stay strong and not give in to their fears and temptations for the sake of Narnia's safety and is met with loud cheers. However, soon enough the boat is shrouded within the fog, and the green mist soon enters the boat and goes to every single soul to entice them all with their worst fears. While Caspian hears his father repeatedly call him a disappointment as a king, Edmund is tempted by the White Witch's promise of making him a ruler. Soon enough the crew hear a voice yelling at them to keep away, Edmund shines a light to find a man who they discover to be Roop the seventh noble attempting to send them back. Eustace quickly grabs the man and places him on the boat, when Caspian names himself Roop is happy but urges Caspian to turn the ship back and warns everyone around him not to think of their fears or they will manifest. But Edmund does exactly that and a massive sea serpent awakens and attacks the Dawn Treader. As it shows itself and its size to the crew Eustace decides to take it on and shoots fire at it. Problematically though, this creature takes him underwater and yanks him up to smash him on some rocks. Eustace does manage to set the creature on fire which immediately retreats. Problematically, Roop decides to fling his sword at Eustace which causes him to fly away with it. Drinian knocks the noble out to prevent him from causing more trouble and orders the crew to turn back. While Lucy hopes for Aslan's help, Eustace crashes onto a beach as the sea serpent returns to wrap itself around the Dawn Treader. As it breaks many parts of the ship, Caspian gets an idea to smack the creature against some rocks. Edmund then distracts the beast long enough to push it directly into the rocks ahead of them. Elsewhere, Eustace wakes up to find Aslan in front of him. As the lion roars Eustace finally goes back to his human form. Aboard the Dawn Treader, the serpent is still alive and stronger than before, Caspian realizes that they can beat the sea serpent since it is just a manifestation of the green mist. Eustace awakens to grab the seventh sword and the crew in the meantime ready the harpoons. They all simultaneously injure the creature as Eustace hurries to Aslan's table with the last sword, however the mist stops him from approaching the table as the White Witch tempts Edmund yet again. As Eustace fights off the mist and the crew fight off the beast, Edmund is offered to be a king once more. Eustace beats the mist and unites all swords to unleash their power which connects to Peter's sword allowing him to slay the sea serpent and the white witch. The spell around the dark island finally begins lifting and reveals the beauty of the island as the three nobles awaken from their slumber and all the disappeared Narnians return as well. Gale spots her mother and her father sees her too. They hurriedly swim over to her and their family is finally reunited. Another reunion takes place when Eustace swims to the Dawn Treader and Reepicheep greets his friend. However, when he discovers that the seawater is sweet, it is proof that they are in the vicinity of Aslan's country and Caspian, Edmund, Lucy, Eustace and Reepicheep take a boat ahead. Eustace apologizes for his grumpy behavior throughout the journey and the others praise his good deeds as a dragon. Finally making it ashore a while later, they see a large wave ahead of the beach which doesn't fall. Aslan joins them and tells them they have all done very well. He then informs them that his country lies beyond the wave but warns them that they cannot return if they choose to go there. Wanting to find his father, Caspian approaches the wave and as he almost goes through he decides to remain as per the responsibilities of being a king. Aslan praises him and speaking of his dream to see Aslan's country, Reepicheep says that the adventures he has had in the world have not stopped his yearning to enter. Aslan accepts his request and the crew say goodbye to their dear friend. Eustace is hurt the most at seeing this, but nonetheless Reepicheep uses a small rowboat to go over the wave, confirming that this would be Edmund and Lucy's last time in Narnia just as Peter and Susan had done. Aslan tells Lucy that in her world he has another name. That the whole purpose for entering Narnia in the first place was so that by knowing Aslan in Narnia they will know him better in the world. He then opens up a portal and Caspian tells Lucy, Edmund and Eustace that he considers them all family. After an emotional farewell with each of them, Aslan is also told goodbye, Eustace asks if he will return and Aslan says he will when they need him. 
Walking through the portal they emerge in Lucy's bedroom where the flood gradually recedes, Eustace places the painting back on the wall and the ship disappearing from view is the last thing everyone sees before leaving, the end, and as usual make sure to drop a like if you enjoyed this recap, thanks for watching and see you on the next one.